hear me or at least in some way understand what's being said would be helpful. Um, <laughs> Everyone at the same time. <laughs> um, I think we have a panel here which brings together almost all of the valuable and interesting perspectives on internet freedom that you'll find in many different parts of the world. And it's great to have wonderful, interesting and um, illustrious panelists here. So starting from my right, we have Dan Baer from the US State Department. We have uh, uh, let's me uh, Linda Corrugedo, I hope I spelled, uh, said yeah. that correctly, from the European Commission, DG Connect. Then further to my right, we have Sarah Logan, still from ANU, and Dr. Madeline Carr, now of uh, Aberystwyth University. On my left, we have Gillian York of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and far on my left, Lou Schout from HIVOS. So we'll also be having Marietje Schrage from the European Parliament here, hopefully. She's um, having some difficulties making her way here, but I'm sure those difficulties will be resolved shortly once they've realized how important she is to speak in this panel. Um, I believe we also have a numerous amount of remote participants, I've been told. So um, if there's any other remote participants who want to speak or make their voice heard, please feel very free to do so. And also to the audience, this is meant to be as interactive as possible. So there are going to be slots of presentations about the basic issues and then questions in between, starting from more factual and then moving increasingly into more analytical dimension. So if there are no further questions, I'd like to get started with uh, Linda, who will be opening the presentations. And um, yes, thank you. <coughs> thank you so much, Ben, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I think a lot of you listened to Nelly Cruz this morning, so uh, you already know a bit uh, uh, what our policies are in this, this field. But nevertheless, I would like to explain a little bit uh, what the state of play is uh, uh, as regards what the Commission is doing to protect Internet openness. Uh, for the EU, um, the Arab Spring was a wake-up call, I, I, I dare say, and I, I think that goes for many others as well, to the fact that Internet is a very powerful tool to support human rights and, in general, to favor the democratization process. Um, therefore, uh, the ITC policy, which is our field in DG Connect where I work, uh, we want to promote the MENA region and we also want to promote elsewhere uh, to secure a fair, open and transparent market for telecommunications. Um, a modern, open and vibrant use of the Internet for all is also one of our pillars and uh, a diverse media environment. As such, for what concerns international relations and ICTs, our effort is to focus on a number of activities to support a truly free and open Internet. And how do we want to do this? Well, it, it's to be done via, firstly, the liberalization of regulatory telecom frameworks that, in, uh, that gives an incentive to compliance with human rights standards. We also stimulate regulatory development in key ICT areas like users' rights or consumer protection. And we provide support to modernize audiovisual media frameworks with independent media regulators. Finally, we also support stronger infrastructure investments and increased R&D opportunities. Um, about a year ago, Nelly Cruz um, presented um, a, a strategy that is uh, called No Disconnect Strategy um, to assist civil society, human rights and political activists so that they can circumvent arbitrary restrictions imposed on Internet and other electronic communication technologies. Through it, we want to guarantee a truly unhindered access to Internet in places where the state exerts massive surveillance, content blocking, or where grave human rights violations take place. In this regard, I would like to applaud the work of many open source producers of these tools for freedom, as their work is essential to the security and privacy of activists, bloggers, journalists, and citizens online, something we also discussed this morning uh, with Nelly. So what are the main pillars of our strategy? Just for your uh, knowledge uh, building, if you don't already know, 
Um, the pillars are tools to increase the freedom to communicate, education and training to use technology in high-risk environments, better capabilities to understand almost real-time what's happening on the ground, and strengthen cooperation among stakeholders. So what has been done so far? Well, we have a addressed already various issues in the, in the year that has um, gone by since the launching of the strategy. So we support telecom operators and other EU business working on the ground in the event of complicated decisions and circumstances that may have negative consequences for human rights. Uh, and we have strengthened our dialogue with the in ICT industry stakeholders to, to that effect. Um, this way we can also better support industry to achieve their co corporate social responsibility and human rights goals. In cooperation with another uh, uh, Directorate General in, in, the, in the Commission called DG Enterprise, in the beginning of nine, uh, 2013, so next year, we will issue guidelines on human rights and business as a result of the implementation in the EU of the United Nations Framework for Human Rights and Business. This is the so-called Raji Framework. We are also working towards better emergency response capabilities uh, through the creation of a European capability for situation awareness. This will allow us to integrate in a single platform various sets of data from multiple origins concerning the status of network connectivity and network traffic alterations or restrictions, as well as information on the legal, social and political developments related to the use of the internet and media for the exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms, particularly in non-democratic countries. In the area of prevention of misuse of what you, Ben, have called the worst of the worst technologies, we provide our technical support to development of policy concerning the dual use regulation. <clears throat> this we do together with DG Trade, which is uh, the Director General in the Commission dealing with the foreign trade and also concerning targeted uh, sanctions and stricter export controls of ICT goods like we did in Syria and now in Iran. Uh, we are also uh, f funding research and development, as you know, and network, uh, for network infrastructure, and our c programs are completely compliant with human rights conditions, and several of the funding calls we have launched this year have a clear human rights uh, orientation. We are founding a number of projects to support human rights defenders with special focus on cyber censorship and surveillance through the European Instrument for Human Rights. And the projects that we have received, because we, we made a call for, for, uh, for pro, 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 proposals, uh, they are under evaluation at this uh, precise time. Um, with regard to technological tools, many f funding calls this year under the seventh f framework program for research and development uh, also tried, will accommodate objectives related to the testing and development of privacy enhancing tools. And there will also soon be an open call for what is called open labs to test facilities because before they are given to activists and we have recently launched a call for a co-confine co um, uh, program which is meshing and, and, and um, related um, technologies. So finally, we have tried to ensure better cooperation with and among stakeholders, including engaging with other countries uh, with internet freedom strategies through our ICT dialogues that we have with th third countries. And we have also held seminars with stakeholders in the field of circumvention tools, activist security, and with a number of academics and representatives of international organizations to, to support this community building. So this is what I wanted to, to say to lay the ground a little bit for the continuing discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Linda, for those comments. I think they're extremely valuable and provide a wonderful basis for future discussions. Um, it's hard to talk about internet freedom initiatives without mentioning the State Department. So if Dan Baer would like to make a few remarks on what they've been doing in this regard. Great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to be here today. I think um, what I'll do uh, to lay out uh, some 
food for thought for the, the topic, the main topic of discussion here today about what works and what doesn't, uh, more or less, um, is to just say a few words about how the State Department has approached this, uh, particularly uh, under the leadership of Secretary Clinton over the last few years. Uh, and then we can go from there, and I'm happy to answer questions because uh, I'd rather guide what I say by what people are interested in than talk too long at the outset. Um, first of all, internet freedom as a, uh, as a policy is something that, uh, you know, there have been a number of uh, policy processes within the State Department and across the U.S. government that have, have unfolded in the last few years, but you can kind of trace the arc of it through the three speeches that Hillary Clinton has given on the topic. Um, her, her first speech uh, early on in her tenure, which put internet freedom on the map, per se, as a, as a foreign policy issue. Uh, the second speech, which really um, elaborated on the, the, the kind of sub policy, ch the sub internet freedom heading policy challenges, finding the right measure of security with the right measure of liberty, et cetera, and laid out the fact that there were challenges um, that internet freedom raises, but that they are solvable and that they are solvable through fidelity to uh, international uh, universal standards and, and, and principles. And, th and then the third uh, speech, which kind of drilled down into an area that many of our governments and uh, civil society and, and industry have been working more and more on, which is the, the role that business plays, given the private sector's uh, outsized role in this area of kind of human rights conversation, the role that business plays, including discussions like export controls, et cetera. And so uh, that's an area where the policy is very much ongoing, where we're very engaged today, et cetera, uh, but that she highlighted at the, uh, at the conference hosted by the Dutch last year, uh, late last year in December. Um, our internet freedom policy uh, guides both our diplomacy uh, uh, and our programming in this space. And, and so by diplomacy, I mean uh, certainly bilateral diplomacy around the world where our, where our ambassadors and others engage uh, foreign governments both on concerns and, and on working together to preserve uh, a free and open internet, as well as um, coordinating, so uh, including efforts like coordinating at the Human Rights Council where there was a resolution in, in, in July, and notably uh, a coalition for freedom online which was uh, started at the conference hosted by the Dutch uh, last December, had its second meeting in September in Nairobi, and will have its third meeting next summer uh, in Tunis, hosted by the Tunisians. This is a coalition of, of governments who are, it's really a coalition of the principled, um, a coalition of governments who, at, before they joined, agreed to a certain set of, uh, of principles to preserve online freedom, um, and has p proved a useful diplomatic coordinating mechanism. But I want to zero in on the program specifically because I think those are kind of the, the more tangible initiatives that this uh, panel is concerned with. Um, the, our, our programming um, tends to divide into a number of segments. So by programming, I mean uh, grant making. Um, by the end of this year, the, the State Department will have made over the last four years uh, $100 million worth of uh, grants in the internet freedom space. Um, our, our, our programming tends to break down into first uh, funding technology, um, the, the uh, innovators who create and distribute technology. Second, what I call cyber self-defense, which is a, a range of training activities uh, for civil society and others who, who find themselves under threat in uh, internet repressive environments. Third, R&D, both uh, research and uh, development in terms of uh, technical aspects, as well as the kind of research that, that gives the baseline for the evolving threats of inter uh, uh, to internet freedom around the world. And fourth, which can be kind of grouped with the previous two in some ways, which, it was, which is advocacy, helping the, the civil society, the parts of civil society that are uh, participating in policy discussions, both at the domestic and international level, that that uh, have a bearing on internet freedom and the continuation of internet freedom, helping them uh, have the tools that they need in order to be better advocates. Uh, our programming is guided by, um, by a number of, uh, of kind of principles, some of which have derived from our experience over the last few years. Uh, first of all, the, we try to be very disciplined about having all of our programming geared toward the purpose of enabling more people to exercise their human rights. Uh, online and through new technologies, particularly in diffi difficult places. So that is the goal of all of the programming. Um, it's driven by threats, and we recognize and have, uh, have confirmed through experience that the threats uh, that people face in different 
contexts are very different. There are, there are some places where, um, you know, DDoS attacks are, are, are a primary threat that's faced by many, many NGOs. There are other places where uh, a technical filter blocking access to information may be the, the, the dominant threat, et cetera. And so because things are, uh, because we try to customize our programming to, to meet the threats on the ground around the world, we spend a lot of time talking to people who are on, in those environments um, and trying to learn from them about what emergent threats are, wh what tools they need, what help they need in order to be able to exercise their rights. Um, third, there, there's no silver bullet in this uh, space. Uh, many of the people who, um, uh, well, I think technology in general uh, is a field in which there's always a hot new thing that, that is perceived to be the be-all and end-all. Um, it drives the consumer aspect of technology. I think in this space as well, there's often um, people purveying something that they think will, so that they uh, purport uh, to or represent as solving all of the problems. Our experience is that there's no one thing that solves all the problems, and quite the contrary. The fourth thing that I would highlight is that there's a very complex value chain involved in helping people exercise their, their rights online, and we're talking not just about technology, but also about the challenge of distributing that technology, about the challenge of making sure that people know how to use it, about the challenge of making sure that it's safe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just to finish up some lessons we've learned, um, one, the technical is political, to, to uh, maul a, uh, uh, an old catchphrase. Um, it's, the technical is political both in the sense that these programs have been uh, highly talked about in the U.S. press, have become, uh, have, have been in and out of uh, newspaper columns, etc. Um, there's a lot of interest in it. There's a lot of interest in enabling particular groups um, uh, of people around the world, et cetera, uh, to exercise their rights. And so this be, we, we've learned that this becomes a very political space. And that makes it challenging to stick to the merits. And so we've been very disciplined about keeping our focus on what our, the goal of our programming is and, uh, uh, and enforcing a strict technical review uh, um, um, a group of people uh, on a review panel assess each of our projects, et cetera. Um, the other aspect in which it becomes political, one that m members of this panel may have something to say about, uh, is that, you know, w within within the United States, one of the it's it's said that one of the scariest things you can say is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we've learned internationally is saying I'm from the U.S. government and I'm here to help. However well intentioned, can be scary to some people, and there are people who we want to support and we want to. Uh, make sure that uh, their rights are protected and that they're, that they're able to defend themselves against threats who understandably have concerns about uh, various associations because they either create more risks for them, et cetera. And we want to be sensitive to those concerns while still achieving the goal of, of helping uh, people exercise their rights. Um, Second, measuring is very hard. Um, it's hard because the technologies are borderless, and so measuring your impact in a certain place uh, with a certain community is very difficult. Uh, it's hard because there are knock-on effects to trainings. We, by their nature, um, th these things are designed to have follow-on effects, et cetera, and so it's hard to determine how successful you've been. But the third thing is that measuring is very important. Making the case for continued investment in this space, et cetera, depends on being able to show that there's an impact. And to that, to that end, um, you know, there are a couple of grants that we've made specifically aimed at helping us better understand what's working and what's not. Uh, right now, we have a, a grant underway with a uh, respected internationally, a third party uh, respected organization that is doing both um, in-depth interviews with projects that we funded in the past to try to, uh, participants and stakeholders in projects we funded in the past to try to determine how successful they've been at, at achieving the specific outputs and outcomes that were, that, that the projects were designed to achieve as well as also trying to assess how uh, internet freedom initiatives more broadly have uh, impact on the broader political climate in, in various societies, which is obviously a, a, a hugely challenging endeavor, but we're trying to, to uh, get a framework at least that can help us be more disciplined as we evaluate the next generation of projects. The other, the other project that which is germane to this is, um, is a test bed of sorts, and it sounds like the 
the EU is also uh, um, uh, looking to engage in this. That, that will si one of the things it does is simulate various internet repressive environments and allow um, the technologies um, that we fund through our grants to test out their technologies to get uh, comments and 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 uh, reactions uh, from technical experts that help them improve them, particularly from a safety standpoint, but also from a usability standpoint. Um, and and we've had success already in uh, having that that testbed provide valuable input that allowed updates and improvements to one of the tools that, that we fund. Um, and we have a number of other tools that are being tested through that, through that mechanism. And that, that also helps us measure and know more about kind of the, the technologies that we're giving uh, wings to as they go out there in the world and ensure that they are as safe and as u useful as possible. So I will stop there and we'll welcome questions in the, in the, in the Q&A period. Wonderful. Thank you very much for both of those fantastic presentations, which I think give us an insight on two of the largest internet freedom initiatives that are currently in place. Before proceeding with further um, analysis from the panel, I'd like to open it up and give people from the audience the possibility to ask questions already. There's two here. Um, do we have a roving microphone at all? Is anybody able to pass a mic? Have to go over to the okay. If you could go to the mics on the other side, that would be wonderful. Should we, if the two of you would like to ask straight away, and in the meantime, uh, if the remote moderators would like to mention if there are any interesting remote participants who want to participate as well, that would be great. Hello. Okay. Hi, Courtney, would you like to go ahead? Uh, with Freedom House. And my question is for Dan in terms of, um, you mentioned the Freedom Online Coalition of Governments and the second conference which happened in Kenya, uh, which I was, you know, had the opportunity to, to speak at. But my question regarding those, the, you know, these initiatives is A, are you assessing how well each government is doing and upholding its commitment? And what are the actual outcomes of these conferences? You know, we hear more and more conferences and initiatives being started around internet freedom, but what are the actual outcomes? And specifically with Freedom Online, um, what, if any, assessment or monitoring is being done of those governments that are part of that coalition? Thanks a lot. Would you like to respond directly? Sure. Um, so. Uh, two-part question. One is whether governments that are part of this coalition are assessed on their consistency in upholding the kind of principles, and the second on, on the outcomes of the coalition and particularly the conferences. Um, in terms of assessing governments, no, there's no formal uh, mechanism for assessing them. However, one of the commitments that the governments that are part of this coalition make is, is to the multi-stakeholder uh, mode of engagement. Uh, the coalition is formally a coalition of governments, but we've made every we've made efforts throughout uh, since the founding to make sure that we are consulting both with industry and civil society. And to my mind, you know, one of the thi one of the values of having there, there are several different ways of solving international problems. One of the ways of solving them has traditionally been get all of the governments in the room and then have them negotiate a common position. This is different from that, and that 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 recipe usually produces a lowest common denominator outcome, something that everybody in the room can, can agree with. And there have been other internet-related uh, uh, meetings where that has been the approach. And there's a value to that approach depending on the uh, objectives you're trying to achieve. But I think one of the values of the coalition was that it didn't start that way. It started with a set of principles that the price of entry was you sign up and say, yes, we're, we're also committed to those. And in that respect, I think, first of all, um, the governments that have, have joined have joined in good faith. And second of all, civil society and others, certainly we would, as a government, have no problem with uh, if we saw one of our fellow coalition members taking steps that we thought that doesn't seem to be uh, fully consistent. You know, hey, you know, we're in, we're in this group together. We're, we're, we're committed to some principles together. Do you see what's going on here? And certainly civil society would be able to make the same points that these governments have signed up to um, to work together, but also to work together on the basis of some principles and where there's where there would be gaps, including with my own government, um, I think it would give uh, an opportunity to, to weigh in. So in that sense, I think the assessment possibility is, is weighed in by the design of the, the coalition, which I consider to be useful in this case. In terms of the outcomes of the, of the conferences, you know, the conferences are one of the chief ways that we can, um, in a 
systematic way consult with, in a multi-stakeholder way as a coalition, and so they're valuable from that res in that respect for the government. Um, the coalition itself has been valuable in several different fora in coordinating governments. Uh, f m uh, most recently, a couple examples. One, um, there was a uh, th there continue to be several new regulations. Um, uh, that are coming close to being promulgated by the government of Vietnam, which would pose not only significant commercial uh, uh, implications, but also uh, free freedom of expression implications. The coalition was useful in coordinating government uh, diplomacy on, on that issue by coalition members. Um, and another example would be the, the resolution that passed in, in Geneva uh, by consensus in July on internet freedom where the coalition members were able to meet with our Geneva representatives in advance of the June session or during the June, June session of the Human Rights Council and make sure that we were all working together uh, to support that, that initiative. So I think there have been some, some concrete diplomatic outcomes out of the coalition and, and we continue to look for new opportunities to do that. I guess the third thing I would say is one of the things that the Kenya conference did um, quite usefully. The Kenyans did a great job of leading that, of, of convening it. They brought senior level leaders there. Um, it gave us a chance to, to hear from the Global South uh, participants because there were more uh, participants from Africa than there are typically at these conferences. And one of the criticisms that we've faced all for over recent years is that the conversation is too often Euro-American centric. And um, the coalition is a commitment to a set of principles, but it also involves members from all continents, and so it gives us a, a, an opportunity to have a, a sounding board um, and, and a way into broader, broadening the conversation while still not departing from the, the common set of principles. Thank you. Um, I believe we have another question from Hadi from the floor and one in the back, and if you could both keep the question and response a little bit brief just so we can continue. Also, if anybody has any issues getting earphones, if in doubt, you can have mine. So please just continue the debate. Uh, Hadi from um, Delft University. The uh, question is primarily to Dan, but may maybe both speakers can talk about it. Um, you talked about lots of interesting uh, initiatives going on, uh, but you, I think, touched upon a very important topic about that uh, when you're helping NGOs, the fact that the money comes from the U.S. government, it actually creates, uh, makes some NGOs self-censor themselves, and then you are actually working with some NGOs which are uh, maybe more further apart from the countries because they are less vulnerable to being labeled to be working on this. And perhaps, I don't know, if the funding comes from more neutral sources, from, for instance, from the EU, that would help in certain cases. And the second question uh, is one thing you didn't mention is about the f negative effects of the sanctions on programs that people can download. And uh, often these are programs that normal people use for day-to-day -day operation of the Internet. And this is causing lots of trouble because they can't get updates, etc. Thank you. Would you like to respond briefly? Or should we get another question first? It's up to you. But I'll do it in less than 60 seconds. Go for it. Thanks. Um, so first, in terms of the funding and, and the neutrality, I think uh, you're, you're quite right. And we're sensitive to that. Obviously, we only control the funding that is done by the US government. And, and that's that's we're working within that reality. And um, it may be a good opportunity for us to collaborate with the EU where we find um, grantees who would prefer to work with the EU and we can um, help share information. I, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but we try to work, work within that parameter as effectively as we can. Second, in terms of the negative effects of sanctions, you know, this is a very live debate right now, both in the, uh, the editorial pages, but also within uh, government. There are people on both sides who say that, you know, we're not doing enough to, to sanction uh, the, or to stop the, the transfer of technology. And those who say what we are doing is too restrictive and is, is having negative effects. And I think that just evidence is the ongoing challenge with any form of sanction or export control, which is that it's, it's never as refined and targeted as you absolutely want it to be. And, and therefore, it can't be the sum total of your policy. Um, and we're, we are working very hard to make sure that ours are as effective as possible. Just last month, we announced um, publicly uh, what had been ongoing policy, but we were trying to make sure that it was well known that we would welcome applications from companies for licenses for export of the kinds of technologies that you're talking about to repressive environments, including Syria, um, because we want to encourage them to, to not hold back on things that would empower people on the ground. 
Wonderful. Thank you for that brief response. I believe we have a second response as well. Just, just a few lines. Yeah, we 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 agree that uh, for sure it is an issue where, where where the money comes from, and that we we have to be careful. Uh, and we do think that the EU um, has has credibility on the ground. Of course, we we are 27 member states, so we need to coordinate among us ourselves before we get started. But uh, we are doing things now. But also some of the member states have been and, and are very, very active to, to, to in, in this field and are deeply engaged, uh, some of them since years. So, so this is the strength that we have. It's, it's uh, sometimes a bit slower, but once we get going, it's pretty, pretty impactful and, and, and effective. On sanctions, I agree very much with Dan. This is a really, really difficult issue and, and it, it, you know, it might hurt both ways. But um, here we, I, I just want to refer to sanctions to, uh, against Syria and Iran. Of course, these decisions have, are being taken after a lot of analysis, what the, what the results and the outcomes will be. And only after that has been done do we go in, ahead and impose sanctions. Thank you. And if I can just add another response to that, um, with all due respect, I, that's, I mean, the, the debate that's happening in the U.S. is not um, about whether we should or we shouldn't. There's different technologies. We have some technologies which can be used by governments, whether they're dual use or single use, can be used by governments to restrict citizens. And then the vast majority of technologies that have been sanctioned um, on Syria and Iran have been done so since 2004 and after. They were not carefully evaluated, in my opinion. Um, and they're on consumer technologies that... I have not yet found a single way that a government could use Google Play against its citizens. And so I think that we need to think about this from two different types of technologies and those perspectives. And yes, I mean, I'm, I'm fully supportive, even if I don't necessarily think it's the right path for strategic reasons, I'm fully supportive of the idea that we should sanction any technology that um, could be used against citizens, against activists. But I don't think that's what's happening in the U.S. Thank you. I believe we have one last For the record, now. there's no sanction against Google Play explicitly either. So you're, you're, I, I take your point, but your point is also an ob oversimplification in the sense that uh, it's not that they have singled out those technologies. It's that the, the language is written in such a way as companies believe that their technologies might fall under it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I believe we have one more question from the floor, but I'm glad the speakers are already agreeing on some of the key issues. Now we can... Okay. Uh Regarding the issue of internet freedom in democratic states also, uh, I, I would like to know from you about the specific case of uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange case. Is that question directed to anybody specific on the panel or in general? Everybody. Does anybody feel qualified to respond to a WikiLeaks question here? Anyone? I reply as a Swedish because <laughs> extra <laughs> Please, um, I believe the question deserves a response from whoever's able to respond. Okay, I, I'm not sure that I'm the most qualified person on the panel to respond to this, but I, I am interested in this WikiLeaks issue in the context of internet freedom, and I think what it raises is a very interesting question um, about where the line in the sand is for different countries, different states, ab about internet freedom. Um, I know that Hillary Clinton's explanation um, for her um, you know, opposition to WikiLeaks was based on a kind of legal argument that, that information was stolen, and I and I understand that. But information is often stolen and posted on the internet. And I, I think it's, it's just an interesting illustration of where states fall down on these issues. Not, not fall down, but where they come down on these issues. Every state has a boundary about w where they feel internet freedom should extend to and where it should stop. And that differs from state to state. And WikiLeaks was the moment where we saw where it you know, where, where the boundaries of that were for the United States. That's my, my humble opinion. Did you want to come in, Dan? <laughs> All right. Um, I wasn't going to take the bait, but I just want to, I just want to offer the, the observation that, um, first of all, an, a stated objection to something does not equate to taking legal action against or, or, or forceful or exerting force, et cetera. So, I mean, to say I disagree with someone or I think that it was an irresponsible act is not in any way contra contravening that person's action, uh, con contravening that person's freedom to, to take certain actions. 
it's important to note that there were many, many publications that republished things that uh, that were allegedly stolen from by Wiki, by well stolen and then transferred to WikiLeaks. Um, the United States government did not shut down the New York Times. We did not block the New York Times website. We did not block the the websites of others that that published these things. There was no. Uh, I don't see that as at all contravening our our position our policy on internet freedom uh, you're quite right that there was an act of theft that happened there was an act there was an act by one of the US government's own employees that that in transferring information illegally and that could have just as easily happened with a briefcase sneaking out of a building as it did it happened to happen electronically but it could have just as easily happened with a briefcase and that would have been we would have prosecuted that theft in the same way had it been a briefcase uh, that was stolen. And so the, the kind of internet freedom is g getting confused in this issue, but all of the internet freedom aspects of it are ones in which uh, I think the U.S. policy is consistent with uh, the way that we took steps to um, address what was a, a gravely irresponsible act that undermined the safety and security of many, many people who are working on behalf of human rights around the world and was not conducive to preserving the kinds of international cooperation that preserve the world in which we all do exercise our free expression and, and try to solve global challenges. So, Thank you very much. I think those were two helpful responses. Um, we now have two positions from civil society, Gillian York from the EFF and Lou Schrott. Um Gillian, would you like to start? Or? Sure, I'll start. So um, I will say that um, I'm partly playing the role of Sami Van Garbia today, who couldn't be here. Um, and I, I, in looking over his, um, he'd written this piece uh, about mm, two years ago, a little bit more, um, uh, looking at internet freedom initiatives and, and specifically heavily criticizing the State Department initiatives. And so when I was preparing for this, um, I was thinking through it and realizing that many of the things that he said at the time, in my opinion, are no longer true. So <laughs> that makes this kind of a difficult role to play, and so I will be in injecting some of my own ideas. Um, for example, I would say that one of his main points at the time was that in Tunisia and Egypt, two of the countries that he was heavily concerned with, he felt that any promotion of Internet freedom was a hypocritical act given the U.S. government's upholding of dictatorship there. And I agreed with it firmly at the time, but that's a different case now. Um, and so if looking at the other issues that we have, I would say that I think Everything that Dan said, for the most part, and in his opening, I agree with. Um, but I think that if we look beyond the State Department to other ways in which the U.S. government as a whole, through different agencies, etc., is funding Internet freedoms, um, I can find problems here and there, and I, I, so I'd like to just highlight a few of those. I think the first part is that I'm so glad to see um, that we're doing this. I, I know in the, in the EU context it's open labs. I, I'm not sure of the name of it in the U.S., but basically these training environments or testing environments where we test out the tools. Um, but I also think that that's coming a bit late in the game because we've got a number of tools that have been ruthlessly torn apart by various activists um, for their lack of security. And I think that uh, whenever you've got the U.S. government putting their putting their uh, imprimatur, is that the right word in this context, um, on a tool or putting their money behind it, um, we should be absolutely certain that that tool is secure. And it's so far emerged that that's not the case with every tool that has been funded through a U.S. government agency. Um, that said, there are also some wonderful tools being funded. And so I don't, I'm not here to discredit. I'm pointing out some of the things that have come up over the past couple of years. Um, another issue I think of concern by some of the people that I work with in other parts of the world is um, the issue of where the where the shaping of campaigns and where the shaping of initiatives comes from. Now this was a hard one for me to see because I think that a lot of the government funded trainings are not incredibly transparent um, it, it, and what, what I mean by that is I as someone who does see these folks on a regular basis and is in communication um, I don't really know who's being trained and for what and granted I think that there's definitely um, an issue with security that we don't want to be publicizing these that we don't you know just for the same reasons that Dan and uh, one of our uh, um, audience members raised you know you have to concern yourself with the safety of the people who that you're training and so I'm not saying that we need to be a hundred percent transparent here in naming names but at the same time um, I think that the the su all successful initiatives um, come from the ground and they're shaped by the people on the ground and so insofar as we are funding trainings and other um, activities that um, have an influence on the internet freedom initiatives coming from within a country um, I think that that's just something to be careful of um, 
Another thing was about uh, research and development, and this is something that I'm going to criticize some of my own work here, so <laughs> um, not entirely my work, but um, a few years ago I worked at the Berkman Center, and one of the papers that Sammy uh, cited in his piece from two years ago was a study that we did on the Arab blogosphere that was funded in part, or in whole, I'm not actually sure, by the State Department. Um, and Sammy criticized this by saying that, uh, where is it, sorry, um, not going to find the exact quote, but basically he criticized it by looking at it and saying that it was problematic in the way that people were categorized. Now this, this study it looked at the Arab blogosphere, it looked at different segments of that blogosphere from um, let's say leftists to Islamists to what have you, um, and it was very much shaped around a, DC, a Washington DC oriented type of dialogue. Um, and so the government is funding this and the study is being conducted by researchers, many of whom I will admit did not have uh, expertise in that region of the world and so then what you end up with is in some ways it was an excellent study it, it looked at things like gender and age and who's blogging and language all of those things were accurate but then when I started to look deeper at some of the keywords and categorizations it concerned me because if it if that sort of thing is what's um, influencing how these tools are then funded and distributed then I think that we have a problem uh, <laughs> which I'm sure you can see um, and then the other issue I guess the final thing that I would add um, it's just a matter of, um, I think that uh, looking now at the way the tools are being funded, I'm seeing a much stronger diversity and I'm very happy about this. But looking at the trajectory over the past few years, um, we saw a lot of the, the fund grantees um, and funders looking at circumvention early on as a silver bullet. And I know Dan said it's not a silver bullet, and so I think we're on the same page at this point. Um, but I'm still seeing that from some of the, the grantees, and I, I think that, that that gives me pause and caution um, in some of the ways that these tools are being developed and used. Um, I think that we need to look at it much more broadly, and I think it's quite telling that some of the best security measures, um, and I'm not going to toot my own horn, but this is the only example I could think of in the quick second that I was developing this, HTTPS everywhere, I apologize. We we had something to do with it. Um, but some of some other things like that, some of the things coming from Google in terms of security and encryption rollout, um, have come from civil society or corporations that are unrelated to government. And I think what that speaks to is actually a need for more collaboration. And I don't mean collaboration in that we should all be in one big couch together happy um, and taking all that, you know, everybody taking the same money. But I think that um, there's definitely a missing piece of dialogue happening between government, corporations, those funded by government, and those not funded by government. Because you have to have the whole landscape, you have to have that diversity, but I'm not seeing that communication happening. And so I've got my network as a civil society activist working, working for an independent organization in the U.S., and uh, this, this um, State Department grantee has their network, and there is some sort of collaboration that should happen. It doesn't necessarily mean money, but that, that conversation, that dialogue does need to be happening. Um, and so I guess I will, I will pause there to, to make sure that we've got enough time for others. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Lou, would you like to uh, add a little thoughts from different parts of civil society, but also very interesting? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to start this, I don't think that um, there is an increasing agreement among states that uh, Internet Freedom Initiatives should play an important role in foreign policy, as is stated in the introduction, introductionary remarks for this panel. Just having a look at, uh, uh, for instance, the Freedom House Index 2012 illustrates that there is a re reverse trend going on. Increasingly, freedom, uh, Internet freedom is under threat in a fast-growing number of countries and governments are curtailing the Internet. The level of control is increased and governments are clamping down on internet freedom act activists, including uh, the situation here in the, in, in the host country of this um, conference, as I understood. HIVOS, my own organization, has been working on ICT for development since the late 19s. Development in the broad sense, including human rights and internet freedom. For, me, for many years now we are working on access to internet, digital safety and security, internet freedom and freedom of expression in general. This is done by providing support to organizations that give training and create manuals on digital safety. And yes, this is no silver bullet. By providing spaces where bloggers and cyber dissidents can meet each other and exchange information on circumvention and surveillance threats. We are also supporting campaigns to get arrested bloggers, human rights defenders, journalists and cyber activists who are released. This year, a new large and ambitious initiative was launched by the Dutch government and the American government, it's already mentioned, in the, in the framework of the Freedom Online Conference in Nairobi last September, the so-called Digital Defenders Partnership. The plan for this fund 
the Digital Defenders Partnership Fund, was already announced during the first Freedom Online conference in the Netherlands last year in The Hague. The Digital Defenders Partnership Fund is initiated and supported not only by the Dutch government, the, U the US government, but also the U United Kingdom, and enjoys the broader support of the Freedom Online Coalition. The aim, to establish an international, the aim is to establish an international fund that wants to promote, secure and advance human rights online. The fund is committed to keep the internet open and free from emerging threats, especially in repressive and transitional environments. It does so by first enabling emergency support for the internet's critical users like bloggers, cyber activists, journalists and human rights defenders and by two by supporting the strengthening of emergency response capacity among relevant stakeholders. That HIVOS is hosting as an international organization based in the Netherlands, but it is offices worldwide, is hosting and managing this fund as a natural flow, I think, from our activities in the field of ICT and internet freedom, as earlier mentioned. As an emergency fund, the Digital Defenders Partnership will provide quick support in response to a range of emerging threats to internet freedom from supporting bloggers and cyber activists who find themselves under threat uh, and, and, uh, and uh, in countries where the internet is not free, filtered or, or not accessible. This can be support for secure web hosting, DDoS mitigation, provision of self-convention software and tools, digital equipment or the increase of emergency response capacities of existing NGOs or social technology organizations. The fund will be operational from the beginning 2013. Our own experience so far has learned that seen from a civil society perspective only an integrated approach works consisting of at least three components, namely protection, policy and pressure. To start with, the first one is protection. Our partnerships and projects seek to raise activist awareness of and skills in dealing with online threats. We call this smart activism. It aims to enhance secure communication by offering training, peer-to-peer -peer learning and research. A prime example is our support to the Arab Bloggers Conference, a biannual meeting where bloggers from all over the MENA region come together. A second example is our strategic partnership with Technical Tech, providing civil society organizations with a security in a box package to help them work more safely. And just very recently, we started a new partnership also in the framework of the Freedom Online Coalition, the so-called Internet Protection Lab, together with two other Dutch organizations, Free Press Unlimited and Access for All, a Dutch internet provider, in which we, together with international partners, will explore and foster research and development around these very technical and complicated issues. The second component of a coherent strategy, in my view, is policy, policy development. Pressure, politi polit political debate and participation is much needed in many countries to open up space for internet freedom and freedom of expression. We feel it's crucial that civil society joins in on the long-term future of the internet. Therefore, together with our different partners, we are publishing the annual Global Information Society Watch Report. Just very recently, we launched this morning here, uh, the newly report for 2012 focusing on internet and corruption. The report lays out the state of the internet society and internet governance worldwide and offers country-specific action steps for improvement. The third component, as mentioned, is pressure. It's essential to put international pressure on regimes that abuse human rights online. Various HIVOS partners try to garner international attention for individual cases, like the network behind Mid-East Youth, while other partners like Threatened Voices, related to Global Voices, offer an insight into the prevalence of blogger and activist persecution by collecting and, and attracting the suppression of online free speech. Under the motto, see it, film it, change it, witness, another partner trains activists to capture and collect videos showing human rights violations. These records can then facilitate the lobby for assistance to human rights, increase international pressure on uh, regimes, and in general it's here on this component where a collaboration and international coalitions for internet freedom can and should make a difference. Finally, and maybe this is the fourth component of, our, of a consistent strategy that works for internet freedom, governments should practice what they preach. In calling for internet freedom worldwide, they must practice internet freedom in their own countries first and stop legislation and practices that tighten control on the internet under the name and excuse of the fight against terrorism, cybercrime, child pornography, hate speech or blasphemy. 
Internet freedom should not be treated different from other rights. The same rights that people have offline should be protected online. And also very important, it is not acceptable that such governments still allow their tech companies to export censorship and surveillance tools to repressive regimes. regimes. Concluding, so all in all, it's our conviction and experience that only an integrated approach works, including all these components, protection, policy, pressure and consistency. Practice what you preach. Thank you. Thank you for those two extremely frank statements on the, the state of things at present. I'd like to ask if there are any further questions from the floor now, given that we've heard from both governments and NGOs. If there are any further questions, there's a second microphone on the left, so please, if you could make your way to the microphone, we'd be happy to hear from you. Sorry, I should talk closer. Can you hear me now? John Kampfnay, um, external advisor to Google on freedom of expression. I'm also a European advisor to the Global Network Initiative. Just really following up on the last uh, point, um, just wanted maybe it would be difficult for Dan to answer, but I'll, uh, I'll ask you to give it a go, and, and maybe Maritza and, and Linda as well. To what extent do the domestic internal security policies of governments affect your ability to project the message uh, externally. That's uh, perhaps a, uh, an easier way for you to address the practice what you preach point. Um, uh, from my own backyard, the, the UK is parting a d uh, data communications bill, or it's, at least it's being assessed in Parliament at the moment. Um, that is not only um, uh, poorly drafted, it's um, wrong in principle, but also it's my um, uh, conviction that it will also send some very difficult messages for that country's foreign office to project its otherwise laudable and the US State Department's laudable uh, goals for broader global internet freedom. Thank you. Are there any responses to that from the panel? I, I think, um, John, I, I mean, I think you, you ask a very fair question, and I, I guess I would answer in kind of three parts. One, one is that, um, you know, the challenges that any country, I mean, all countries face challenges with respect to security, maintaining rule of law, et cetera. So th there, there are a set of challenges that, don't, that existed before the Internet and new connection technologies and that exist after and that, you know, intersect with that. The, the advent of these new technologies and there are policy challenges that arise because of new technologies and so we have to, to solve them um, and that's that's not unique to any one country I think you know you're quite right that it becomes difficult for a couple of reasons one um, I think the 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 affirmative answer to how you do it is that we have to make sure that it's not specific practices that we're arguing against or for but rather a broader approach, um, and that approach includes a transparent democratic process to devise the legislation that governs certain practices by governments, that is, you know, uh, reviewed publicly, that is voted on uh, by an independent legislature, that is ex uh, executed by an uh, independent executive that is democratically elected, that is reviewed by a judiciary, etc., uh, amidst a context where people generally have their rights protected and upheld by the judiciary, etc., and, and I think, you know, I, I feel very comfortable with the story that the United States has to tell with respect to the overall process. And I think, you know, every, every government and every legislature uh, around the world, dem democratically elected, uh, no matter how legitimately elected, et cetera, will sometimes um, make policies that either inadvertently or advertently um, have negative effects that are inconsistent with the constitutional protection of rights, et cetera. And there's a process for remedying that when that happens. And I feel confident in the process for remedying that uh, uh, within the United States, so I have no problem representing that broader package abroad, and I don't think that there are, it does pose major, major uh, challenges uh, in terms of consistency. There are certainly a set of issues at any given time that there's an ongoing debate on, and there's an ongoing debate domestically on a number of issues, and there is one internationally, and so, you know, we can be up, for, up front and forward about that. I think what we have to be firm on, and what we are firm on domestically and internationally, is that the, the policy decisions that are being taken ought to be consistent with first principles, including 
universal human rights standards, um, and that that should be uh, a governing uh, parameter for, for making these decisions. Um, I think the third piece of this, which your question kind of touches on, is, is that there are really two conversations that are going on in the internet freedom space. There's one that's a sincere conversation that's happening uh, with the participation of government, civil society, industry, etc., um, a range of actors who are genuinely committed to sorting through the practical questions of how you make policy decisions that are consistent with guiding principles, that that raises tough issues that are genuinely tough issues, t ten where things are in tension, and people who are in good faith trying to work out good answers to that. There's another conversation where um, every security issue or every potential uh, bad act, etc., becomes a justification for repressive policies or for limiting expression or for uh, 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 unjustifiable invasions of privacy, etc., by another set of actors who, who gratefully import examples from the, from the genuine conversation and use them uh, nefariously and disingenuously to make arguments for policies that are not consistent with, with universal human rights principles. And the first step that we can take to dealing with that reality is for those of us who are involved in the good faith conversation to be conscious of that second conversation that's going on and to not play the fool in giving arguments to those conversations and to, to call them out when, those, when, when something that's a, a genuine challenge gets imported into that disingenuous conversation and used in a way that it, it ought not be allowed to be used. Any further comments on this? Sure, thank you very much. I haven't had a chance to uh, uh, address you, but I will uh, later, and I apologize for arriving slightly late. Uh, I think a few concepts that are important um, uh, for us all to remember is that we risk having a kind of parallel universe between the security uh, thinkers and people that are engaged in security policies and those who care about freedom. And uh, this shouldn't be the case because uh, we've learned um, more than anything in the war on terror, but in general we know that uh, our uh, values and principles uh, do not allow for a zero-sum uh, exchange between security and freedom. So I think we should all work on bringing those environments closer together. Uh, in the Netherlands we learned a pretty interesting lesson, where it was actually an Iranian activist who uh, notified the certification authority, also used for websites of the Dutch government, of a breach. Uh, of security of this certification. And what this teaches us, or uh, reminds us of, is that there are not separate domestic and international environments, or at least increasingly less so. Um, recently, our um, Minister of Justice made a proposal uh, for uh, seeking authority to allow for government to hack back, or to proactively hack. Uh, and we should only think about which kind of tools should be used for this would be developed by government to, um, to uh, have these capacities and in whose hands these tools will inevitably end up and what this will mean for our own security concerns. In other words, we're all part of a big system where uh, a great idea in the context of one country where there may be such checks and balances, where there may be democratic oversight uh, is already problematic, let alone in a country where the rule of law does not exist and uh, where governments uh, may be directly opposed to, to our interests. So I think there should be much more thinking going in in the early development phases of technologies, in the R&D phase, but also through scenario studies of what the deployment of certain technologies could actually mean. Uh, there is a vibrant debate now going on around about drones, uh, which is an example, I think, uh, uh, of where this, uh, where this might go. But we have to keep in mind that uh, we're finding ourselves in an increasingly challenged, challenged position uh, as lawmakers um, bound by uh, national laws, national constitutions, the territory of the nation state for jurisdiction, uh, while operating in a de facto globally connected world. Thank you very much. I uh, believe there's one last comment. Thank you very much, Ben. Well, just to inform you that uh, speaking about cleaning on our own do doorstep, <coughs> we are preparing um, a, a cyber uh, security strategy in, 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 the, in the Commission and also with the external service. So this is a joint initiative not only of Mrs. Cruz but also of Cecilia Malmström 
who's uh, in charge of, of home affairs, and uh, Baroness Ashton, who's the, 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 the boss of the external services, as, as you all know. So the idea is, of course, to, to secure our own system. It will be a strategy and a legislative piece to, to, to accompany it. And Part of this is also to project our core values uh, internationally. So this is very clearly said. I, I only have a draft of this, and I ca cannot share it with you because it hasn't even been adopted in the Commission yet. But just to say that this is coming um, either at the end of this year from us or beginning of next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for keeping you waiting for long, but we have another comment from the floor. Please. Uh, my name is Ibtihal Abali. Hi. Hi, my name is Ibtihal Abu Ali. I'm from Bahrain, which is uh, a close ally of the U.S. And it is also where a Romanian blogger has to go and hide in for more than one year and, uh, and a half now with a 15 years uh, imprisonment sen sentence because he have set up a website. I want to comment on the difficulty to measure initiatives and I want to highlight one thing that does work, in May 2011, when Bahrain arrested a blogger, Mahmoud al Youssef, the State Department has issued a statement to ask the government uh, to release him. It, his name was mentioned, and it was a clearly uh, defense of his right to freedom of expression. Within 24 hours, he was released. I want to compare that with what happened just this July when a Romanian human rights defender was put in jail for a tweet. The State Department comment was, it is complicated. Now the man is still in prison. That did not work. Even more users are being taken to jail. Just in the past two days, three has received sentences for prison, also for tweets. Now my message is, Speaking out does work. Please speak out more regularly when it comes to defending freedom of expression online, especially in countries which you have good relationship, which you have ability to influence their governments. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful statement. Are there any further comments on that or to respond to that directly in ways that public statements can be useful or helpful in relating this further? Gillian, please. I think that um, <clears throat> in that particular case, I, I, I think I would have to agree with you, and I think that the U.S. has not done nearly enough when it comes to Bahraini uh, dissidents and, and human rights defenders. I would also note that I think um, I, in the first case, I believe you might have been referring to Ali Abdul Imam, and I know that Maricha has actually uh, mentioned his name before on the floor in the European Parliament. Um, but I would say that more generally, I think it is more complicated than that uh, beyond this specific example of Bahrain. Um, there are some cases where trying to think of how I can say this while respecting the sensitivities of the issue. Um, there are some cases where I've known someone who is at risk, who knew that they were probably going to be arrested, who either were or were not r arrested, depending on the case, and where they said, do not do not let a government speak out in my name because it will put my family at risk. Now that may not be the case in Bahrain. I, I am admittedly not an expert, but I don't think that it can, I don't think that it's a universal truth that as long as a government says it, it will happen. And I think that that's best exemplified with Iran. Now granted, we don't have the relationship with Iran that we do with Bahrain, so it's a different consideration. Um, but I think that there's probably something that needs to happen here as a solution to that where NGOs and civil society organizations are more closely attuned and in touch with those or those the families of those that are at risk so that we have that information beforehand before the case happens and granted that's not possible in every case and I was reminded by that by a couple of my friends in the audience when I wrote something about this not too long ago that um, while in Bahrain or in Syria or some of the places where I've worked um, people you know know what they're getting themselves into they know the risk that they're at but there are so many other places in the world where you sort of have more of the case of the accidental activist the person who is isn't an activist until the day that they speak out and the day that they're arrested. And so um, I guess my only caution to that would be that while I absolutely agree with you 100% on Bahrain, I don't know that we can accept that as a universal uh, idea. Thank you. Um, if there are no further comments on that, then I'd like to invite uh, one of our speakers who's happily just arrived but has also made it here, thank God, to the panel. 
and um, we're moving a little bit the debate. Uh, we started with the initiatives of the present. We've seen some civil society and governmental perspectives, and now trying to look a little bit towards the future and see in which direction things can progress in the next few months to develop and think forward on internet freedom initiatives. So, Maritia, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and let me begin by uh, congratulating Dan on behalf of the US government with the re-election of President Obama, uh, which um, I think was welcomed by most of the world, uh, especially by most Europeans and myself. Uh, and um, it al is also appropriate, I think, to highlight the leadership of Secretary Clinton uh, in the uh, internet freedom sphere. Uh, we are now also free to, you know, criticize these initiatives, but at least uh, it has s had a significant um, uh, importance for pushing this uh, topic onto our agendas. And I just want to uh, to highlight that publicly in the context of the re-election of the president. Um, the EU, unfortunately, has not developed such uh, far-reaching or uh, ambitious plans, and it is my uh, goal to, to see the EU as the global leader here, because I do believe that the EU is, uh, in many ways, better positioned, uh, also because we're coming to this later, so we can uh, benefit a lot from lessons learned. Let me also highlight, uh, while we are uh, here in Azerbaijan, that um, in the heart of the thinking about digital freedom that I do in the European Parliament, I always have people in mind. And I think it's very important to uh, stress that digital freedom or internet freedom does not exist in a vacuum. The very first uh, resolution that I worked on after I was elected uh, had to do with two young people from this country, uh, Emin Mili and Adnan Hajizadeh. I hope I pronounced that correctly who uh, were attacked and imprisoned for their activism, both online and offline. They quickly became known as the two bloggers, but that was clearly not the only thing that was going on. Um, we need to focus on the broader issues of the rule of law, human rights, democracy, uh, free expression, uh, etc., when we're talking about digital freedoms. And so I just wanted to highlight that specifically because we are here in a country uh, which uh, we would love to see move uh, to a better space there, also on uh, the role of press freedom. Um, uh, another uh, brave person of this country, Khadija Ismail, was uh, awarded this week for her courage in journalism, uh, and I think that is very appropriate uh, because she's been intimidated for her outspokenness. In the European Parliament, um, I've worked on a number of issues um, regarding digital freedom uh, since 2009. I thought it was very important to be on the agenda, and we've come uh, a little bit closer to, uh, uh, to where we should be. Uh, by pushing for earmarking the budget of the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, which allows for the development of technologies and the education of uh, human rights uh, activists and organizations around the world. Uh, we've pushed in the European Parliament for sanctions uh, on the export of technologies to countries like Syria and Iran, which uh, have now been implemented, but they still have a very uh, ad hoc character, and we need more uh, mainstream policies um, that would increase transparency and accountability on the part of both companies and governments. Last week, um, we took some initial steps to this regard uh, when we voted on the dual-use regulation, which has been mentioned by some of the other um, speakers. It was not the full update that we're expecting next year, uh, but in the context of some technical updates, we were able to uh, pass some amendments. Um, one of these amendments um, ensures that all information and communication technologies that can potentially be used for human rights violations such as surveillance, uh, censorship, monitoring and tracking technologies uh, need export authorization and that member states must prohibit or impose licensing uh, schemes on the export of dual-use items if they're not already listed uh, in the existing uh, lists. Uh, and the amendments uh, further passed also allow for more flexible and swift updating of uh, lists and countries to ensure that we uh, are actually more credible uh, in the EU uh, when it comes to our exports. These uh, initial steps are important, but we need much more to improve the licensing scheme uh, as well as enforcement and um, implementation. So we need the member states, but also you, uh, representatives of several uh, civil society organizations, internet users in general, um, governments, activists, uh, and anyone who feels the need to help uh, to stop 
the trade of digital arms. And uh, we're developing a campaign to do so, and anyone who is interested in joining, um, please let me know. It's come up um, throughout the discussion a little bit, but I think this dual-use regulation or the uh, regulation of exports fits in the context of the need for better alignment between different departments in governments. We often see that, let's say, a trade department, a defense department, or a foreign policy department uh, have very different views uh, by default of their focus, but uh, there's a need to better align and coordinate. And the same goes for the EU. Uh, the No Disconnect strategy has been mentioned. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, Commissioner Cruz is involved in this, but I think we need more leadership and involvement in the entire digital freedom agenda from the External Action Service and the High Representative. Uh, also in the development of these new cyber security ideas, let me please emphasize uh, once more the need for an integrated focus on uh, digital freedom whenever we talk in the EU about um, cyber security. Um, some ideas for the first strategy um, that the EU should develop on digital freedom in the world were actually adopted yesterday by the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, I took the lead on this um, report and the goal is to mainstream and streamline the role that technology plays in the context of all the EU's external policies, trade, human rights, enlargement, development, uh, diplomacy, but also in uh, human rights dialogues, for example, and to ensure that there is conditionality and that there are safeguards so that people can safely uh, access an open internet and so that the free flow of information is uh, preserved. Um, we also recommended training on uh, the actual use of documented and shared human rights abuses in the context of international law and court cases. Um, and uh, there is a recommendation for better strategizing uh, on the EU's part when it comes to internet governance. Quite appropriate here. Um, there's also further recommendations on uh, the improvement for export uh, controls um, as well as um, concrete proposals in which the EU, which is the world's uh, most significant development aid uh, provider, can actually integrate the role technology plays when it, for example, um, helps or funds the uh, development of information uh, infrastructures in third countries. They should be uh, conditional um, and the EU can help uh, with know-how from regulators to ensure that uh, people's freedoms are also protected uh, and that laws when it comes to uh, telecoms or uh, free expression uh, in countries of transition are updated to, to the highest possible standards. Um, I think uh, it's also important to update the knowledge of people in the foreign policy uh, arena, but more generally uh, those who are making policy on the role that technology uh, plays. And indeed, it's been mentioned a couple of times, better cooperation and uh, shorter lines of communication are needed between um, uh, civil society, uh, businesses and governments. Uh, I think we should start thinking about the concept of human rights by design. We all know uh, the principle of privacy by design, but why not uh, widen this to human rights by design when we're talking about the development of technologies and again uh, the crucial uh, R&D uh, phase. Uh, and let's expand the circle of, of the debates uh, which we have. Let's include more people because uh, looking into this room, I'm very happy to see so many familiar faces, uh, but there are a number of people that are not attending uh, events like the IGF that should be a part of this discussion. And I think we should all do a little bit more to include more people in these very important um, discussions. And then last but not least, um, the evaluation of programs is very important. As with any policy, uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, democracy is a work in progress which needs constant uh, improving and updating and uh, we need you all to be a part of that. Uh, so there's no, uh, no um, idea or um, presumption of perfection here uh, whatsoever. Thank you very much. Um, then we have our last presenters after Ms. Schache, which is uh, Sarah Loger and Madeleine Carr, if you'd like to present, please.
Thanks, Ben, and thanks to um, the other panellists for some fascinating presentations. Uh, Madeline and I are going to speak about emerging threats and trends in internet freedom, and we'll be speaking on this from an academic perspective, uh, from the discipline of international relations, so taking things in a far more abstract direction than they have been already on this panel. So I'll be speaking briefly today about two emerging threats to internet freedom and asking how they and responses to them can be incorporated into the internet freedom agenda. My research focuses on social movement theory and counterterrorism, so that's where my interest in these issues stems from. The first emerging threat I'll be talking about is the role of the internet in incitement and communal violence. Now, we're all familiar with the example of the innocence of Muslims and Google's role in uh, censorship in Egypt and Libya. Um, as many commentators, including Julian, have pointed out, this is a difficult and complex situation. Uh, it's about efforts to stop rolling violence and the role of the internet in perpetuating that violence or otherwise. But in some ways, the innocence of Muslims example is, if it's possible, less complex than a similar situation arising in other countries. For example, in large southern Indian cities earlier this year, an eruption of communal violence was fueled, by doctored Im fueled largely, or at least in a, to a significant degree, by doctored images circulating on social media. In response, the government censored the internet and cut mobile phone services for a number of days. Here, here, in this example, it's not just one video which is the problem. It's multiple images and multiple actors engaged in creating and sharing those images, some involved in direct incitement to violence and some not, but collectively and cumulatively, the violence occurs in response. In this context then, and given Google's example, is India violating internet freedom by censoring the images uh, to try and stop the physical security of their citizens being violated? Another example is current unrest in South and Southeast Asia being fueled by, or arguably fueled, fueled by doctored images of persecution of Burma's Rohingya Muslims. These images are arguably fueling sectarian violence in Bangladesh, Thailand, Indonesia and Pakistan. In this case, would it be okay to intervene and try and stop the escalating violence around the Rohingya issue by censoring some of these issues? At what point do governments have the right to intervene on these issues, if at all, uh, particularly when the physical security of their citizens is, is threatened and trammeled by online activity? In the Internet Freedom Speech of 2010, Secretary of State Clinton said, we do not tolerate those who incite others to violence. But here, as in the Innocence of Muslims example, the line between incitement and fuel is difficult to draw, and it's one that is going to be increasingly important to clarify within an internet freedom agenda. And Dan talked about two separate conversations on internet freedom that are often occurring, one sincere and one disingenuous. And I think this is one area where those two conversations can really flow into each other for, for nefarious effect. My second point is about the threat to internet freedom from what the most recent Freedom House report on internet freedom refers to as paid commentators and hijacking attacks spreading into misinformation. To save time, I'm going to refer to these practices as narrative entrepreneurship. This refers to covert and overt action by governments to create and control an online narrative that's in their interests. The Freedom House reports, report lists examples of this behaviour, including pro-government sources in Jordan hacking into a popular site to remove a post calling for reform, or government hijacking of influential blogs and Twitter accounts in Venezuela, using them to propagate government views. And of course, China's infamous 50 cent com commentator army can be included here as well. But the report also talks about what might be slightly less nefarious or at least more overt practices like the Cuban, Cuban government hiring 1,000 bloggers to progress its aims or Bahrain and Malaysia hiring international public relations firms to progress their narrative goals. Now, I'm not judging these governments and their goals. I'm just looking at the processes that they're using and how we can, can incorporate them or not with an inter internet freedom agenda. My first question is, is this type of narrative entrepreneurship, especially the latter, more overt kind, actually a threat to internet freedom? Isn't more speech better speech, whatever the source is? And haven't governments always used such overt methods to try and influence their citizens? And Western governments do, certainly. And not to draw too close a comparison, in fact, these more overt approaches are arguably a hallmark of current US and UK online counter-extremism campaigns, producing videos and other on online content to create and disseminate a counter-narrative to the hate spread by AQ-inspired internet users as a way to combat internet uh, online radicalization. So my point is, firstly, is online narrative entrepreneurship actually a threat to internet freedom? Obviously, hacking into other people's accounts and posting false commentary under their name is. But is the hiring of public relations firms, the dissemination of damaging rumour, and similar approaches also a threat to internet freedom? Now, maybe it is. If so, how? And if it is, how do we combat it? If you should do something about this, what can you do about it? It's, at the moment, most internet freedom initiatives focus on technical initiatives like funding t innovation, managing the export of digital arms, and rating technical censorship. Can positive counter-narrative entrepreneurship 
like online extreme initiatives, extremism, counter extremism initiatives, be included in an internet freedom agenda, or education initiatives in critical media, media consumption. I'm just wondering whether there's a place to talk about this or not, and if there is, how do we do it? So these are questions I'm arguing will become more and more important as the rest of the world comes online, and which will, as a result, be more pressing for the internet freedom agenda in years to come. Now I'll hand over to Madeline. Okay, thanks, I'll be quick. Um, as Sarah said, we're talking about these issues or really examining these issues from an international politics perspective and, and I think in, in the big tent the other night in the Google big tent, Vinton Cerf made this comment that states should participate in this multi-stakeholder process as equal partners. So not as dominant partners, but they should be participating as equal partners. And I want to just kind of talk about that today and highlight three things that I think are an impediment to um, the progress of internet uh, freedom in this context. I think Lou made the point that he's observed a decline um, in states promoting internet freedom um, and I think that in some regions this is the case and I, th I hope that what I'm going to talk about today can kind of shed some light on that. I want to talk about three problems. The actors involved, um, internet freedom as a foreign policy and the problems of uh, the public-private partnership. So we know that internet freedom is not easily extracted from other issues and, and, and frameworks because ultimately internet freedom is value based. It's, it's about values, it's qualitative, it's subjective, and, and ultimately it's, it's also political. This is the case with many transnational problems that states have to deal with um, today, in environmental degradation or pandemics, for example. So states are increasingly developing mechanisms for cooperation, in part driven by these issues that they can't address on their own and that have broader implications. Now, when states' fortunes are bound together in this way, a particular type of power becomes evident. And in international relations, we refer to this as hegemonic power. Hegemonic has negative connotations, but in, in international relations, it just means the power to set the agenda, to define the rules, boundaries, and limitations of behavior and what is legitimate. And it's a very important um, source of power. States. We understand that states will do this, they'll, they'll seek to establish a framework in a way so as to enshrine their own view of the world and enhance their power. And, and this is a way of exercising power into the future. If you set up the framework the way you want it to be and the way that works best for you, then you're guaranteed or you're, you're more assured of exercising your power in the future. Um, now this is just normal state behavior, but this activity raises concerns amongst other states, particularly if they have a differing worldview. They worry that their concerns will be engineered out of the discourse or the framework for action. Now at forums like this where we're talking about um, establishing a framework for legitimate practice in, in this kind of internet ecosystem, um, th this, is what, this is what we're doing. And I think um, Hillary Clinton said in her internet rights and wrongs speech that the choices that we make now will affect the way the internet runs in, in the future and I think she's absolutely right. But I think when we're doing this, having these conversations, we seem to be missing some important actors. And I just want to want to highlight this. The, the 21st century is being referred to by, to by many people as the Asian century. Um, by 2025 it's predicted that Asia will not just be the most populous nation in the world, the pop most populous region I'm sorry, but it'll be the biggest economic zone, the biggest consumption zone, and the home to the majority of the world's middle class. The last Internet World Statistics told us that of the 2.4 billion people currently online, uh, 1 billion of them are in Asia, and that's only 27% of the population in Asia. So huge growth to come there. Africa has a population of 1 billion um, and only 15% are currently online. Europe and North America combined are 800 million people online. But of course, because of high penetration rates, we know that that future growth is, is not going to be anything like it is going to be in other regions. So in terms of a balance of voices contributing to the establishment of this global framework, I think we still have a way to go and, and I think that that is one of the, the impediments to um, progress on this issue. The second impediment is this, this way that internet freedom as a global civil society concept is, is conflated and wrapped up in foreign policy. This is, not a, this is a problem for states. Um, 
the, the two are related, obviously, but from an international relations analysis perspective, they're distinct. Internet freedom is a central pillar of 21st century statecraft in America, and it's a doctrine that sees that civilian power is a mechanism for bottom-up change obviously with many positive benefits, but nonetheless from an IR perspective you can see how a foreign policy agenda that's intended to promote US power in the international system in this way is a cause of friction in international relations. Um, I think that Hillary Clinton actually has a very nuanced approach to internet freedom and I think she's unfairly criticized because uh, this comes back to the WikiLeaks question and I wish I'd ended with Dan's comment because that was what I wanted to say. It's just not actually where my interest is. But, but I think Hillary Clinton's criticized for on the one hand promoting internet freedom and on the other hand saying there are these limitations to it. It only goes so far. Um, but I think that what she's doing is really confronting the tension in these debates. She, she doesn't shy away from it. She's very upfront about that. She has this view that liberty and security, while they're often presented as, as non-zero, she regards them as, as um, you know, one enhancing the other. She says that the challenge is to find the proper measure. So enough security to enable our freedoms, but not so much or so little as to endanger them. Now what she's doing here She's promoting her own state approach, which is perfectly legitimate and it's to be expected in the context of international relations. Seeking hegemonic power to establish a framework favorable to U.S. power and U.S. norms is, is uh, um, absolutely normal um, behavior for states. But other states regard themselves also as having a legitimate right to their concerns and they'll make that same calculation that she does in the context of, of their own, you know, their position in the international system, their domestic opinion uh, and a particular sets of norms that they adhere to. So in terms of a foreign policy of internet freedom, this can and probably is perceived by other states as somewhat problematic. The third and final point that I want to raise is the problem of the private sector, and I think this is an issue that really requires further investigation. It's been raised several times over the last few days, and I think it's highly problematic. Um, it, the public-private partnership as a, as a mechanism has gained currency over recent years as an, as an explanation for the framework of relationships, responsibilities, and rights in the context of all things Internet. But what exactly constitutes this partnership is very unclear. The private sector is a key actor in Internet freedom. When it's being contracted to develop software to help actors in repressive states avoid restrictive practices, um, or conversely, when, when private organizations are accused of spying and, and banned from tendering for government contracts like Huawei has been in Australia, when they're charged with making decisions about content, um, which you know, firms like, like Google are repeatedly asked to in a range of states, and when they're seen as, as responsible for developing and extending information infrastructure on a market-led basis, because remember, access is also an element of internet freedom. Actually, I think partnership is a normative and aspirational term that in some instances masks an abrogation of responsibility and agency by governments and allows the private sector to pursue profit in a framework of social justice. The private sector, like the state, many would argue, is driven by survival and growth and not by the promotion of internet freedom. I think a better term for this approach, both in terms of internet freedom and, and also in, in terms of security, is outsourcing. The public sector outsourcing to the private sector. And I think if we refer to these arrangements using this language, and employed a much more critical eye to what we as civil actors and as states expect from the private sector and what authority we assign to the private sector. We could be a lot more honest about how we approach these problems and avoid the notion that there's a partnership um, in existence between government and, and private sector with shared goals, which I'm, I'm deeply skeptical about. So these three issues, the, the narrow representation of voices, um, in these debates about how the internet should work in the future, the role of internet freedom being folded into foreign policies that have other than human rights agendas attached to them, and the ambiguity of the roles, rights and responsibilities and authority of the public and private sectors I think can all be understood as impediments for the, the promotion of internet freedom. I'd suggest that without engaging more deeply with governments as stakeholders in the process of shaping and defining the ecosystem of the internet, we risk fragmentation of the type that's been recently proffered in, in Iran. I think the incentives for remaining connected have to continue to outweigh the disincentives for state for states. Um, 
If we want to promote a globally cohesive internet, we can't avoid the spectrum of views of, of other governments, and nor can we avoid the, uh, avoid the diversity of opinion in, in a global civil society that, frankly, does not speak with one united voice. Vinton Cerf also said in the tent the other night that we're not here to arm wrestle but to talk, and I think those were very wise words. I think a lot more talking is needed, um, and I think engagement with states that have problems with Internet freedom is, is really important. I'm not suggesting that we, we ignore um, you know, human rights or tolerate human rights abuses on or offline, but if we really want to promote a cohesive global Internet, we're going to have to deal with these, these political issues. I think it would be great if the next UNIGF were able to catalyze a greater diversity of, of views and opinions on these matters so that we could more meaningfully fully engage with those viewpoints that differ from our own rather than those that, that are similar. Thank you. Great. Thank you for those wonderful perspectives. Also looking into the future, how this can be developed further. Are there any questions from the floor that would like to be asked before we start wrapping this up? Any further positions that want to be discussed? Please, a comment. Sure. Um, I just want to make, well, It'll be one comment in a couple of parts, but I'll, I'll try to make it quickly. Um, first, in terms of your question about do do um, do the promotion of certain content online does that pose itself a threat to internet freedom? I think the threat that it most often poses is that it creates either an excuse or a temptation, depending on the government, to clamp down on freedom of expression, and therefore uh, it, is, it, it can have a knock-on effect that is a threat to internet freedom. That, that's m my perspective. There's a bunch of stuff on the Rohingya, et cetera, that I'd love to discuss, but we don't have time. Um, secondly, just because I think this is a really important point, um, first of all, the U.S. government has worked very hard and will continue to work hard to expand the number of actors who participate in these conversations. Um, I, I agree that, that you know, it's important to maintain that open conversation. Um, but it, on your second point in particular, I want to make clear a couple things. First, first of all, that there's no specific political outcome. I, I think that it's good that you brought this up, but there's no specific political outcome that the Internet freedom uh, foreign policy agenda within the U.S. government is dedicated to achieving other than preserving the, the ability of people to exercise their rights online and through new, new technologies. It has been described, I know, in, in, in some contexts as regime change by another name or something like that, but I can tell you, and, and you can trust me or not trust me, but, but I can tell you that in the discussions about how to formulate the policy within the State Department, et cetera, there's not a, it's not a specific place that we're talking about, et cetera. It is a, a set of principles that we're trying to give give reality to. And I think connected to your, you know, use that as a lead into the hegemony point, um, I guess I would say it, uh, you could argue that the U.S. policy is dedicated to promoting a world that is governed by certain values, but you describe those as American values, and I would describe them as universal values and as the values of human rights. And there may be some specific examples of our policy that you would call out and say you don't think that that, that, that particular um, piece could be articulated as a, uh, in a Kantian way as something that we would will would be the universal rule governing everyone. But I would ask the question, what percentage of the different perspectives that you expect to be voiced by other governments can be explained not by their different perspective on internet freedom, by, but rather by the fact that they take a different perspective to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that they take a different pre perspective to the International Covenant on C Civil and Political Rights, and so they have an interest in controlling their people and suppressing their speech and suppressing their freedom of association and assembly, and therefore they take a different perspective to internet issues. And if that, it, if there's some significant percentage of the difference in view that is explained by, in fact, a difference in values that is one that is inconsistent with human rights, then I think that the world should not um, submit to the temptation to be overly democratic with a small d and give too much credence to those different perspectives. Instead, we should stand by the universal values to which we've committed, and we should defend them. And, and the fact that people have, di that other governments may have different perspectives because they're uh, concerned about upholding illegitimate, illegitimate governments and illegitimate power over their citizens is not something that we ought to um, feel like we need to give them more uh, voice or more value. Uh, uh, it shouldn't drive us to overly value their, their opinions. Thank you for that. Would you like to respond? Of course. <laughs> 
Thank you, Dad. I appreciate your comments, and I, I, I don't mean to suggest that if governments are not comfortable with, um, with, with human rights, that well, we should just say, well, you know, they, they do things differently in different countries. Um, but what I do think is that um, an approach that doesn't engage with different views is unlikely to progress very far politically. I think that. Um, yeah, there's much more nuance to it. We have two extremes. We have on one extreme states like America and, and many European states which are very comfortable with freedom of expression, that have a long history of those values and they're deeply embedded in their society. And on the other extreme, we have some states where that's absolutely forbidden and you know people are easily thrown in jail for, for speaking out. But I think we have a lot of middle ground um, and there are a lot of states in that middle ground that have some what they would regard as very valid concerns either about security or whatever else and or, or private in, private um, privately um, developed infrastructure and those are concerns that I think it would be more fruitful to engage with rather than ignore and I I just have to say I I, I I'm you know I think internet freedom is is um I think the internet freedom um, foreign policy of the United States is as I said, I think it's very nuanced and it's very well developed, but I would, as an IR scholar, I would argue that it is not simply about universal human rights. I, I'm afraid I would have to include those kind of, you know, commercial agenda and other aspects that come up in the context of internet freedom, but I, I, I um, take your points, Dan. Are there any further questions or comments from the floor? In that case, I'd like to ask the panelists, starting perhaps with Lou from the left, to make some final remarks, if they have anything, and then I'll wrap up the session. Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, a very uh, short remark. Um, we have been hearing a very valuable suggestion from many sides to do more in the field of research, to do more. Government should do more. Um, research institutes do have to do more. Civil society organizations have to do more. Um, Funding organizations like the one I represent have to do more and better. I think uh, if I could, could list uh, one priority, I would say uh, let's uh, give priority to the activities that lead to the defense and to the support for human rights activists and human rights defenders, bloggers, uh, civil society activists, journalists, they, the people that are really in the front line of uh, freedom of expression. Uh, someone said that the internet nowadays is the new frontier on free when it comes to freedom of expression. These people are the real front uh, frontier people and I think we should give priority to active and concrete support to these people. First of all, I'd, I'd just like to thank the organizers and speakers of the panel because I think that this is exactly uh, the type of conversation that needs to be had. Um, I was commenting to someone uh, prior to the panel, and I, I'm sure it will come as no surprise to you, that um, I said, you know, my panel, it, it's kind of the easy multi-stakeholder approach. And I, <laughs> what I mean by that is there's no one on this panel that thinks that freedom of expression is a bad idea. Um, and I'm sure that on certain other panels, when you get into things like copyright and intellectual property, the, the area it's a lot grayer and so I'm, I'm grateful for that but I also think that that's exactly why these conversations are so important because you do have people on this panel coming from very different views backgrounds and places in the world um, I'm, I am uh, sad that we don't have anyone from corporate but then again they might dominate um, and so in, in that uh, in that respect I think that um, you know more of this conversation is all that I would encourage and say in my closing remarks so thank you Thank you very much. Well, this has been most enjoyable. Uh, this is my first IGF, so it's been extremely exciting. It is a good point that you made that, that perhaps we need to bring in even more uh, people into this. But I wanted to make another point also in closing to de develop it a little bit more, and that is to bring in companies, because I, I do think it's important that we do that also. And I mentioned briefly in my introduction uh, about uh, the uh, corporate social social responsibility and, and the ideas we, we, uh, we are developing there. There was actually a communication from the Commission last year, uh, uh, which is a renewed strategy for, for corporate social responsibility spanning from uh, that year to 2014. And some of the guidelines and the actions are actually for, for our area, for the ICT sector and the human rights. So I think this, this will be very important in the future to, to look 
look into and to develop, and we are certainly committed from our side to, to work hard on this. There are other actions as well that I don't have time to mention, but just to, to, to draw your attention to this important work going on. Thanks. I'd just like to thank Ben um, for organizing the panel and, uh, and to my fellow panelists. I, I thought it was a really interesting session and I, I enjoyed everyone's presentations and, and I agree with Gillian that just a little bit more of this would be great. I'd also like to echo that. Thanks t so much to Ben for organizing the panel and to my fellow panelists for a kind of fascinating discussion. Um, I would also like to hear a little bit more from corporate actors who have to make these decisions daily. Um, we, we hear from activists and we know the activist story about you know, hardship and, and, and persecution and pain. Um, and we should, we should always know that and value it, but what we don't hear from are, are, are corporate actors who also have to make decisions, perhaps with not quite so much pain involved. Um, I'd also like to echo Madeline's point about the role of different value structures. Um, I, again, I'm, not here, I'm here not talking so much about political values. I think we agree on the spectrum of really polit political values and where the internet freedom agenda can sit with that. What I'm thinking of more here are sort of social values about things like religion and democracy and, and the expression of religion online and, and social values ab about uh, propriety and things like that. Um, but thanks again to all the panelists. I think I've talked enough, so I'll just say thank you very much, Ben, for organizing this, and thanks to the other pa panelists. I'll also be brief, uh, also because my next session begins in three minutes <laughs> in another room, I think. Um, but um, I believe uh, we each have a role to play, whether we represent a civil society organization, whether we're just internet users, uh, human rights activists, uh, representing a company, a government, or the people, such as we do in a parliament. Uh, and we do to talk to a lot of stakeholders. Um, but I think our role in, in the European Parliament is to uh, push for an ambitious digital freedom uh, policy on the part of the EU uh, that uh, brings us closer to practicing what we preach, uh, and for the parliament specifically in the context of the EU to play an important role in ensuring democratic oversight, which cannot be uh, uh, forgotten in this in this whole discussion. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much to all of the panelists. Just a last few points wrapping up. I think there have been two or three key messages that have come out of this and that I think have been extraordinarily valuable. The first is that um, it's important to have internet freedom positions and policies, but they need to be both principled and effective. And this is hopefully a beginning of a debate starting on these issues to ensure that this can be the case. One point that I'd specifically like to mention, and I don't think it's been discussed quite enough so far, this will be done in a second and you'll be able to rush off to the workshop in a second, don't worry, is that the, the programmatic responses to internet freedom so far have been extraordinarily based on threats and that the responding to threats will be useful and effective in a certain context, but there will also be a need not just for threats, but for visions on where this uh, policy is to develop and where it's to go in future if it's to be long-standing and sustainable. There's a broader agenda that we're discussing here, and this, of course, goes far beyond programming. So it's, there's different interconnected initiatives, but there's a strong role for policy. And um, particularly important as well are the spaces. So not just spaces like the IGF, but also spaces which are collaborative. And it's not a space where people are brought together by the same funders, but where people are able to talk, both funded and non-funded, from different spaces. And also um, people who aren't interested in writing grant applications, but simply want to have a conversation about what's effective and what works on the ground. A last few notes, um, specifically uh, from the organizer of an IGF workshop. Uh, we're closing now, so I can see the winks from the back of the room, but we're really trying to come to a conclusion. But I think it's important to emphasize here that in many aspects we've seen quite disgraceful events in the organization of this IGF. And it's extraordinary as the organizer of a workshop to be in a situation where you have to beg for uh, microphones or earphones for your speakers, where it's difficult to get visas for key panelists, where at the same time civil society are disrupted in their statements that they're not able to make, where things are too loud in the spaces or the translation is not working properly. Now, you could put this down to either incompetence or you could put it down to malice. And depending on which way you'd like to consider that in respect to the government and responsible for organizing some of this, you can come down either way. I think it's extraordinarily difficult to give the governments responsible for organizing this, and one government in particular, it's an obvious that we're in Baku, the benefit of the doubt on this. There's no way that this can be happening. And as a workshop organizer, I think this is absolutely disgraceful. And I think that this needs to be said more loudly and more openly. We've had these debates a year ago when Azerbaijan was chosen as the host country for the IGF, and we can see exactly what's happened now as a result of this. There have been some statements that have been made, but we need to make this more loudly and more vocally. The only time I've ever seen like anything even close to this was in Sharm el Sheikh, the IGF of 2009, and I think we all know what's happened in Egypt in the last few years. Thank you very much. <laughs>